The state of New Jersey has long been known as the Garden State and is one of the only states with a strong agriculture that has survived the increasing pressures of suburban and resort development. This applies specifically to New Jersey's vibrant apple growing industry. New Jersey ranks 15th in acreage and 13th in volume of apples produced in the United States. Each year, New Jersey represents 65 million pounds of apple production with 246 farms encompassing 4,100 acres under cultivation. One man who has been at the forefront of the apple business for almost 70 years is New Jersey's own Coles Roberts. Mr. Roberts comes from a long line of American apple farmers, stretching back as far as the late 1600s. Taking over for his father in 1953, Coles Roberts was the longtime proprietor of Jersey Jerry Apple Packaging Label. Since his retirement from the apple business, Mr. Roberts concentrates his efforts in educating the public about his experiences in the apple industry and long tradition of the New Jersey apple. The first patent on an apple pear was 1802. Now this was at a time when apples were an, a very important crop because they would keep for a long time. And if they were dried, they would keep for a much longer time, but first they had to be pared. So a lot of developing was going on all over the country, all the apple areas, wherever apples were, were raised, and they were raised all over because were still, most farms still had a few apples. So they were trying to devise quicker ways of pairing apples. And uh, it's interesting in that the very first method of pairing apples was with an apple impaired on a fork that rotates and a pairing head with a pairing knife going against it. And that same idea is used in the most uh, advanced apple pairing. The first invention of an apple pair that I'm aware of was in 1778 by a 13-year-old boy. I learned about him in school because he later invented the cotton gin. Eli Whitney's first invention was an apple pear at the age of 13. Probably the first thing Eli Whitney and others did, there were others trying to find a quicker way too, was to impale an apple on a fork that they could rotate, and then held their paring knife against it. Now this doesn't work very well. I can pair an apple quicker this way than without it. But anybody who's handy with a paring knife will do circles around me. The blade needs a guide to keep it at the right depth. Well, the technique they knew they needed was already in use in a tool that was in common use at the time, the carpenter's plane. I don't think many apples were paired with a carpenter's plane, but it did provide the technique. So they used that technique and made a paring head, handheld, that had the blade and had the guide, and they would work that over the apple as they turned it. And that worked pretty well, but it has to be held in exactly the right place, the high point of the apple. And when they were in a hurry, they had so many apples to do, that wasn't always easy. So they attached the paring head to an arm, the paring arm, so it was always in the right place. Doesn't that do a nice job? <laughs> then in colonial days, they would go to the local kinsmith and he'd make them up something like this. That they would push down through the apple, they would take the core out, and would cut it in section. You can get something like this today, it's flat, and it works real well. I come from a long line of farmers going back to the uh, late 1600s. And in the early days of farming, uh, farmers grew many different crops. Most farms had a small apple orchard. And those who later specialized in apples would gradually drop one crop at a time. And uh, eventually, uh, when it got to me, why we specialized in apple. And uh, my dad was one of the early ones to pack in a Western, what they call a Western box. It is a wooden apple box where every apple is individually wrapped in a piece of paper. And it is, it's, each size is packed with a certain pattern, so there's always the same number of apples in the box. And we shipped under the Jersey Jerry apple label 
And uh, we shipped apples all over through Jersey Fruit Co-op, who are now in Glassboro, but we even exported quite a few. And I took over in 1953, and uh, just after that, we no longer, we got out of the packing in those, the wooden boxes, and began to pack in bags and cardboard. And we retailed later under the Jersey Jerry brand. And the pairing arm is mounted on a turntable that takes it around the apple. But when it's only halfway around, the apple's paired. But they have to finish the cycle. And it took just as long to finish the cycle as it did to pair the apple. That meant that half of their effort was wasted. They were, they were wasting a lot of time. And when they had mountains of apples to pair, wasting any time bothered them. So they tried some other techniques. This one now is pairing. It finished pairing, then the, the arm lifts off and gets out of the way. You would take off the paired apple, put on another, continue cranking the same direction, and it pairs the other one on the way back. <clears throat> well, this there were a lot of people buying apple pears. There was a real market out there, but a lot of companies were making them, so the, there was a lot of competition. So they had to keep improving them to keep ahead. But the apple is juicy, your hands get sticky, and if you have a lot to do, that's a real mess. So they made a real improvement in the push-off. You see this arm coming around, it gets behind the apple and pushes it off. There were all kinds of these things. Some of them didn't have a crank, they had a lever that worked back and forth. This was called the Lightning, patented in 1863. Most apple pears have, <clears throat> have names. You just work the lever back and forth. And it works real well. But you had to know when to stop. I became interested in the apple pears, the machines of pear apples. When I, when I was young, there was an a apple grower near Morristown who had some of these machines. Uh, this was a commercial machine, which is not part of my program here, but it was a fascinating thing to watch. And when I had an opportunity to buy one in 1988, I did, and then I took it to gas engine steam shows and demonstrated it, and it was always quite a hit. And then it kind of developed from there, although I've been an apple grower all my life. I'd never really collected apple pears until after I was no longer commercially growing apples. But uh, I became fascinated in these devices that are wonderful examples of people's um, ingenuity and inventiveness, and they developed these machines. In the 70s, commercial pears began to appear. These were heavy, more durable machines, owned by, used by canneries, hotels, bakeries. And they had a tube to take the core out. Just three turns of the crank, and it does it all. You can pair an apple crossways. Then you get an apple with a hole in it that still has the core. Well, this, these worked real well. A lot of apples were paired with these. A number of companies manufactured them. But what they really wanted was a machine that they could use with an outside power source. So, <clears throat> pairs with multiple spindles on a turret that rotates began to appear. Now, I mounted this on a industrial Singer sewing machine base. You can use one foot or the other foot both feet together however you want to do it. I don't think many apples were paired with foot power, but it's fun to demonstrate. But with multiple spindles, while it's pairing one apple, you can load another. So it's a continuous motion, and in the early days, they would be belted to a line shaft overhead that in canneries ran dozens of these machines. The old timers were innovative, and if they could make something that could save them a little time, they had places they could use that time elsewhere. And this slicer is an example of that. 
Those blades are real sharp. I like to know where the first aid kit is when I use this. Well, I've always enjoyed, I, I, I've got involved in this because I've always enjoyed demonstrating machinery or whatever. And uh, apple pears are especially adapted to this because they are fascinating devices. So when I got this, my first um, large machine, the first apple pear I had was this large commercial machine. Uh, within two or three weeks after I purchased it, I had it on a trailer and I had it out in Pennsylvania at a show. And then from then on, wherever I showed up, why they always made room for me to, to do that. I raised apples not very far from here, as Miss Schultz mentioned, Jersey Dairy Apple. And we shipped canning apples to a cannery in Winchester, Virginia. And they use machines, each one does it, pairs 120 apples a minute. They're automatic. The, the apples just float into the machine and the machine does the rest. And that company has 30 of those machines. And during the season, when they run three shifts, they pair over 4 million apples every day. There are many, many canneries like that all over the country. But the first principle of that first apple pair, the apple turning on a fork and a pairing head working across it is used on the most modern ones today. All the patents are in the ways, the different methods that that principle was utilized. But that original principle has not been improved upon in 200 years, and it never will be. It is perfect. And that's the apple pear story. And I thank you for your attention and your good behavior, your good work.